The great Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges imagined once a library very much like this one, which contained all the combinations of the letters of the alphabet. In this library, every text was available, including, of course, a great amount of gibberish. We are told that the World Wide Web is very much like Borges's Library of Babel in that it contains every text we can conceive, every idea we can come up with. The great danger is that we might drown in such a sea of gibberish. My name is Alberto Mangel. All my life I've been a reader. And now, after having lived in many parts of the world and after having spent decades in Canada, I live in France, surrounded by my books. In them, I can trace the reader's journey through history, a journey that entails this most human of creative acts. It seems that in our now high-paced modern world, technology threatens reading, or at the very least, how we read. Computers and the World Wide Web allow us to graze information, taking in only snippets. Are we becoming a planet of information browsers, readers only burrowing shallowly into the world with our new reading technologies? In our rush to find new ways to read, are we forgetting what the art of reading is about? Early in the first millennium, a reading technology was born, the Codex, the book as we know it now. Simple in its construction, it allowed reading to be easily transported and studied. Bookmaking became perfected in the Christian monasteries, where the monks kept the books in precious libraries, the repository for this powerful technology. My library is, in fact, a conglomerate of several libraries collected throughout my life. I have about 30,000 volumes. Compared to a medieval library, of course, it is unthinkably enormous. An Irish monastic library would hold between 500 and 600 books. And the reason is this. It is a Latin Bible copied in a German scriptorium of about 1300 by a monk who must have spent his whole life writing this out from the first to the last page. And therefore, making books would have taken much, much longer. The books took years to create, and they were built to last. One of the greatest of these books was the Book of Kells, containing the four Gospels of the New Testament. The monks took nearly three centuries to finish it. This is one of the cardinal books in the Western tradition. Um, 
principally because it's beautiful in itself. And um, and if you take just from this page here with the the, the, the large capital to the, the next page, um, what always astonishes people when they see Kells is that the alphabet, if you like, the letters, the words themselves, look recognisable. The second thing that surprises people, of course, is that it's in Latin. For the Latin was the lingua franca of the pre-medieval world. But the wonderful thing is that this is a gesture to defeat time. Somebody had sufficient confidence in the technology of the moment to commit this to the future. We can say for certain that, barring fire and other accident, that a vellum manuscript has a lifespan of at least a thousand years. I've got floppy disks at home from ten years ago with manuscripts of books in them that I can't open anymore. We think our technology is so superior, but of course it isn't. This is high technology. Since books were few and expensive, the majority of people couldn't read. It would take a 15th century German genius to make literacy a universal possibility. Welcome to Gutenberg, Gutenberg the, the musical. musical. The lights rise on a squalid, stinky bedroom of a friend of Gutenberg. The roof is made of dirty thatch. In the corner, rats are gnawing on stinky cheese. And lying absolutely still in the middle of the room, without moving, is a dead baby. A friend of Gutenberg and the doctor examine the dead baby. We did all we could. I'm afraid your baby is dead. But! I gave him this medicine. Them ain't medicine, them's jelly beans. Jelly beans? But... If only you could read. See ya. Jelly beans, not medicine. If only I could read, my son he wouldn't need an allergy. Voted in 2000 the man of the millennium, Johannes Gutenberg, the inventor of the printing press, is one of the key figures of world culture. It was here, in this farmer's market, that Gutenberg the technologist had a brilliant idea. By watching local farmers use olive and grape presses, Gutenberg realized that if he could create a similar heavy stamping press for metal letters, he could speed up printing. I'm gonna take this press and make it print some words. I'm gonna change this press, though I know it sounds absurd. I'm gonna take the grapes out and put letters in, put letters where them grapes have been. I'm gonna change this press and make it print some words. And so, Johann Gutenberg worked long into the night, making history to a boogie woogie beat. You go on, Johann Gutenberg. You invent that printing press for all of us. It's the first printing press in history. It's gonna print up books for you and me. It's a printing press and it's gonna print some words. Welcome here to the Gutenberg workshop. This is a hand casting device. It's a very important invention from Johannes Gutenberg. Gutenberg was a machinist by trade who knew how to pour metal into molds. And it was this skill that would help him figure out a better way to make a printing press. And this is an alloy from lead and tin. And then I wait one, two, three, four, five seconds. Making single metal letters was a lot easier than carving wooden blocks, which was how printing was done before Gutenberg's time. This was the same procedure 
and he started his work 1450 here in Mainz. This is a page from Gutenberg's Bible, and one Bible page has 42 lines. Each one of these letters is one of Gutenberg's metal molds. And here is a print, we in Gutenberg's Bible. Foremost, Gutenberg is famous for his Gutenberg Bible, or B42, as it is also called in the scientific world, because it has 42 lines on each page. It is a beautiful book, and uh, it is uh, really astonishing that in this early years of printing, it was finished in 1455, a printed book could look so perfect and so beautiful. The number of Bibles which were printed by Gutenberg were probably around 180 copies. That does not seem so very much or so very many. But they went into the churches and monasteries along the River Rhine and along the River Main and Moselle. And here the people had, for the first time, a Bible where the text really was correct. Because this was one of the problems of the church. They did not have correct text before. Very often they were false because the scribes could not always uh, know what they were writing. Sometimes they were tired and they made errors. One of the first people to take advantage of the printing press was Martin Luther, who some 70 years after Gutenberg's invention realized it could be an effective weapon to support his disagreement with the Catholic Church. When Martin Luther and all his companions started to fight against the Catholic Church, I think the reason that they were successful was that they could print lots and lots of sheets of paper, like leaflets, brochures, little books, and of course, the Bible which was printed for the believers, that they could read it, that people who were interested outside the church, that they also were able to get all the things that were really written in the Bible. Gutenberg and Luther could never have imagined how the printing press would allow reading to expand beyond the religious realm. Mass printing changed the world in innumerable ways, but it also created problems for the books themselves. In our rush to mass produce books, choices had to be made about the materials with which we printed. And now we are paying the price. In every corner of the globe, including this little bookshop in France, we are now feeling the effects of a 19th century book publishing decision. Bon, alors voilà, ce livre-là ne m'intéresse pas pour la simple raison qu'il y a des taches de rousseur, de piqûre, qui est due à la qualité du papier du 19e siècle. Alors que les ouvrages qui sont faits en papier chiffon n'ont pas de piqûre sur le papier. Between 1850 and 1960, most books used paper made with unneutralized acid. These books are literally eating themselves. It seems that millions of these books won't last until the 22nd century. Bien donc, euh, c'est pas la première fois que Monsieur Lamongi euh, ou d'autres clients euh, m'amènent des livres euh, qui sont euh, des livres euh, faits avec du papier à base bois. Pour moi, euh, c'est pas quelque chose. Euh, 
de valable de refaire une reliure euh, dessus euh, parce qu'il faut d'abord passer par une désacidification des papiers ce qui prend beaucoup de temps, qui coûte extrêmement cher et au vu de la valeur de l'ouvrage il euh, est bien évident que ça n'en vaut pas extrêmement la peine donc euh, pour moi, le mieux, c'est encore de le confier à la Bibliothèque nationale. The four towers of the Bibliothèque de France, each of them designed to resemble open books, house more than 12 million volumes. The institution aims to collect every French book published in the entire world a commitment felt keenly by the director general Jacqueline Sanson. Les livres c'est une affaire de passion mais l'ensemble des collections sont une affaire de passion. Euh, ce qui euh, est extraordinaire à la bibliothèque nationale d'abord c'est qu'elle repose sur des collections très anciennes patiemment enrichies parce que on se sent tous euh, partie prenante de ces enrichissements en sachant que les petits-enfants de nos petits-enfants, eux, pourront avoir accès à ces collections. Et ça, c'est vraiment le, la récompense d'un travail en bibliothèque. Dans le cas présent, euh, auprès de mon collègue Christophe, qui est auprès de moi, il est en train de restaurer un ouvrage, un antiphonaire du XVIIIe siècle, dont les coutures sont cassées, brûlées par le temps. Et euh, il, euh, il refera donc les coutures de chaque cahier avec, euh, un, le, dans le même matériau qu'il teintera aux couleurs euh, le plus proche possible de l'original. Euh, L'important est de restituer parfaitement le document tel qu'il était à l'origine. Nous nous trouvons à présent auprès de Marion qui restaure des affiches de la Révolution française, donc 1789, et qu'elle, euh, après les avoir trempées dans un bain, puisqu'elles avaient des pliures fortement marquées euh, par, au fil du temps, euh, elle a ensuite doublé ces affiches de papier japon qu'elle ensuite va découper tout autour et euh, mettra probablement sous presse pour la plupart des affiches de façon à ce qu'on puisse les ranger de face, dans les magasins, euh, soit dans des boîtes ou en tout cas bien à plat de façon à ce que ce soit bien préservé au fil des années qui nous restent à venir. The Bibliothèque's Elite Restoration Team knows how to repair these ancient publications. But what of the acid-damaged books like our Zola from Perigueux? The majority of these disintegrating books will be scanned by the bibliothèque specialists and preserved for readers in an electronic format. Only the most valuable books, like this original edition of Victor Hugo, would normally go through the expensive treatment to save them. However, today, Emile Zola's novel has been sent to the deacidification plant in the Netherlands, where it too might be saved. book sent here by the Bibliothèque de France is registered before being given a chemical bath that neutralizes the harmful acid from the pages. After the bath, the books are dried before being shipped back to the bibliothèque, now free of the acid destroying them. Only the culturally valuable texts are saved. But what of the countless lesser books that are disintegrating on the shelves? Why not save them? 
The risk is serious because what seems insignificant today is sometimes the future's masterpiece. Johann Sebastian Bach works furiously on his fourth Brandenburg concerto. This exquisite piece, though, was nearly lost to history. Bach wrote this important concerto for Prince Leopold in hopes of getting a job as a court composer. The concerto was not well received, so Bach filed it away. 125 years later, it was rediscovered and is now recognized as one of the greatest achievements of the Baroque era. Many of our most cherished classics were completely unknown in their day. They only survived due to the accidental durability of paper. Unfortunately, works that seem trivial today are unlikely to be preserved so that they won't be unearthed centuries from now. The works of our undiscovered Bachs and Blakes are likely to disappear. The threat from acid-based paper is just one of the motivations for libraries to save our books. It became clear to us that digitization was core to the future of the library. And for us to be able to um, get as much as of our content available in digital form became a very high priority. And we knew also, since we're sitting on 53 million items in the New York Public Libraries, that we would never be able to do that ourselves. And when Google came along and invited us to partner with them, then it became clear that there was an opportunity for us to digitize everything that's in print. Alexander the Great attempted to collect the world's knowledge in a universal library on the shores of the Mediterranean in the 4th century BC. Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentine writer, proposed an imaginary library containing every book ever written or yet to be written. But some say that Google's is the first real initiative to scan the world's books our first real opportunity to map the entire written record of humankind. We have all these books that are in a physical form, and we need to transform them into some electronic representation. And so we developed our own technology to do the digitization. We had looked at the technology that was out there and, and realized that it wasn't up to a project at the scale. So it transforms a book into a digital artifact. We have images of the pages. We do optical character recognition, so we get text. And today, when you go to Google, you'll find this content that'll just appear in your search results. But you need to have Google's search engine to find the books that Google has scanned. Having grown up in the libraries at MIT, it reminds me very much of what it was like working with students uh, and faculty at MIT. Bright, articulate, young folks who have a vision of the future. No problem is insurmountable. It's been an incredibly exciting project. Despite the project's apparent potential benefits, there are those who have serious concerns about putting our collective heritage in the hands of a private company. My concern is that uh, our culture is our culture, and the idea that a corporation could own it and could decide uh, what we have access to, when we have access to it, doesn't really bode well for the future without having some sort of control over it. When Google makes these deals with public institutions and the deals that forbid the public institutions from uh, disclosing anything about the deal with Google so that we don't know in many cases uh, what, what these deals consist of, that's sort of a very, that's a, that's, a, that's a red flag in my mind that we need to be concerned about Google as a caretaker of our culture. 
How many how many books would that be? Can't tell you. I think I read something that you're working on seven hundred thousand books or something in some of the published material. I think I, I saw It's part that. of the non disclosure statement. If I say I can't tell you, that means it's covered by the non disclosure statement. Sorry. Google treats this as important intellectual property because we do feel like, um, you know, we invested a lot and we do feel like this is important from a company perspective. And so we just, um, uh, you know, don't share the details of our digitization process. Perhaps today Google's interests are aligned with, with ours in terms of, yes, let's digitize everything. But once everything is digitized, what, what stops school from then deciding, uh, gee, we don't, uh, we don't like that, that part of history. We're going to excise that. I'd much rather see the digitization of our culture be, take place in the context of a public trust, uh, sort of like the library system of the United States, which is not owned by the government. It's not owned by, uh, by big business. It's owned by a trust. One such public institution, the Bibliothèque de France, has criticized Google's plan for scanning mostly English titles, thereby shaping the future of reading and academic research. Many argue that initiatives like the Bibliothèque scanning program should be controlled only by public institutions. By leaving book scanning to a corporation, Who's to say what they might choose to do with the world's printed heritage and what financial benefits they might reap? What if the works of Victor Hugo were one day seen to be commercially unprofitable? Could they destroy the files? And would we even know under the terms of the non-disclosure agreements with our libraries? Peut-être devrait-on montrer celui-ci qui est un des des plus In another great public institution, the Library of Congress, there is also a firm commitment to digitize their collections for future readers. But they've taken another step, creating interactive documents that help readers understand how, for instance, the Declaration of Independence was created. We have put the rough draft of the Declaration of Independence on this interactive device, which allows us to trace back some of the ideas within the Declaration, where they came from, and we can actually see how this document was written. By using this interactive device, we can not only look at the document, but you can see the words that were put in, you can see the ones that were crossed out, and you can trace the timing and the development of these ideas. And as you go down through, you can see changes that were made by Franklin, that were made by John Adams. You can actually see the thought process as Jefferson and the other members of the Continental Congress struggled to develop this Declaration of Independence. Libraries are not only concerned with the preservation of what's on their shelves. Every week, there are millions of pages written in electronic formats. And how are we going to archive the whole of the Internet's content? The equivalent of the acid problem for books is file formats for digital information. Uh, many of us have used computers for many years. Letters we've written, um, college papers we wrote that may be very valuable if we become famous scientists someday are no longer readable because we used a software that is not available anymore and the format of the document we can't read. The Library of Congress's digital preservation program works with scores of partner libraries to collect and preserve important digital materials that exist in no other form. As a library, we are accustomed to tracking things by the whole of the volume. We catalog a book. We think of that as the unit of consumption. But more and more, we find ourselves, even those of us who are really avid readers, consuming only pieces. And that's the part we want to track. 
we hear that um, there will be something called exabytes, which I can't even compute the zeros for, being created within five years. And we know we can only preserve a small amount of that. So we're looking at what is really important. What of our public story today as libraries and archives do we need to save? A few months ago, we got a call from the press secretary in Senator John Kerry's office. And she said, do you have John Kerry's website from the last election? And we said, yes. And she said, could we look at it? So we gave her the link and showed her how to use it. And this is in 2004 when John Kerry was running for president. And these sites do go away. When the election's over, we've tracked them. And it takes about sometimes no more than a day or two, but as much as a month for them to totally disappear. One of our collections here at the library is called Legal Blogs, and these are blogs about legal issues. A future Supreme Court justice could be writing one of those blogs today, and that would become very valuable and important at the time of the future justice's hearing. You know, they always want to consult everything the person's ever written, and if that were not available, then of course it couldn't be consulted. Blogs are being recognized now as a very important form of writing, and more and more um, archivists and librarians are recognizing that they do need to be captured. The nature of writing, as well as reading, is changing online. Interactive novels like Inanimate Alice have appeared on the internet. They allow the readers to be immersed in a multimedia narrative where they choose how the story unfolds. They may also consume the narrative in a very different way. All I really want is this chapter. So I am consuming just a chapter. I'm not consuming the whole. And I think it does change um, the way we read, even fiction. We find ourselves being impatient or wanting to move ahead or let's get to the punchline. And I think we're, we're changing our expectations. So interactive literature may take off because it's a, just a different form. It's a different interaction between the reader and the author. And that's always been there in print, but now it has this different dynamic. Inanimate Alice is the brainchild of the Canadian novelist Kate Pollinger, who realized that online readers were looking for a new sort of reading experience. There is a way in which the book is a, is a perfect technology. It's portable, you can read it in the bath, it's cheap, it's widely available. We understand it, but the book is so venerated in our culture that it's really hard for people to see beyond that. The book itself has become a kind of obstacle to seeing what the possibilities for storytelling beyond the book might be. The challenge with episode five is that she's going to be in the same town, whereas in every other episode she's been in really very different locations around the world. As always, the challenge really is to expand the, the visual look and the way it sounds and the interactivity, but still keeping it free and available online. Presumably, you'd have trouble watching episode four if you didn't have broadband. I really like working with other people. I mean, writing is quite a solitary thing. So for me, it was a great sort of opening out to, to start to work with other people as well in, that, in, a, in collaborative setups and collaborative environments. I came up with this idea of creating little episodes about Alice that told the story of her life up until her kind of mid-twenties. It was a, a good decision early on not to show Alice, because she's never depicted in the episodes. And I think watching an Adam and Alice feels in some ways more like reading than watching a film. The fact that you don't see Alice means that you conjure her in your, in your imagination in the way that you do when you're reading a story on the page.
It's had more than a million viewers now. And since we launched episode four, the um, hits have been in the region of kind of 15,000 a day and, and upwards. I do feel that there's this kind of frontier for experimentation with the new technologies and storytelling that a lot of writers are really kind of just ignoring because of being afraid that the book will disappear. In Japan, there's been a real popular movement of fiction for phones. My understanding is usually written by young women on their phones. They actually write it on their phones. So it's a whole series of text messages, really, which are then collected into novel format. And five out of the 10 best-selling books in Japan in the past year were based on phone fictions. The amazing thing about phones, I think, is that most people have them, and most people have them with them all the time. So as the potential for a content delivery system, it seems to me that the phone is, you know, amazing. That those times when you're stuck waiting for a train, when you're sitting in a doctor's waiting room, whatever it might be, you might not have your book in your pocket, but you're going to have your phone in your pocket, and the potential for um, getting some interesting content on the phone, to me, seems very, very real. Yano Fumi is an award-winning cell phone novelist. At 22 years old, she's a part of a new wave of writers serving a technologically sophisticated generation of readers. <laughs> もともと物語を考えるのが好きだったんですけど、あの、その世に小説が出せるんだったらって思って、それで始めたんですよ。えっと、身近なことを題材にしてるっていうのが一番面白いなと思うのと、何ですかね。そうですね、身近なものをやっているっていうのが一番。The cell phone novels are usually romantic stories involving young professional women. They're written in a brisk conversational style, almost like a series of text messages. えっと、やはり当初、ま、もともと携帯を使われる層というのは10代後半から20代というのが多いので、えっと、やはりですね、携帯小説も最初書く人、読む人ともに、えっと、10代後半、20代前半の女性というものが7割、8割を占めていたか
経験してきたすごいいろいろな人生経験を赤裸々に綴るみたいなやつなんですけれどもなんかこう妊娠したあの10代で妊娠して結婚,結婚して流産してみたいなで相手の男の人がこうヤクザの人でみたいなそういうこう。なんて人生経験をずっと今まで綴ってるみたいな作品なんですけどそういうのを読んでます今まで紙で,て紙で読んでたものがそのパソコンで見れるようになったじゃないですかでそのパソコンでの次がなんかまあ携帯でまた見れるようになってってなんか科学の発達というかなんというかその電子機器の発達とに。開発が進むにつれてなんかこう一緒に変化していくんじゃないかなってでも本はなくならないと思います。The book is most certainly here to stay, but digital reading is also now an entrenched part of the reading experience. Here's the two laptop sets. Here's one for this team. Here's one for this team. Guys, go. These children are trying to use a new kind of laptop computer designed with a different operating system than Macs or PCs. If digital communication is to become the main method by which writers and readers connect, What will happen to readers in the developing world? Already, many of these people have no access to books. The One Laptop Per Child program aims to give children their own laptops, tools that will help them become fully connected digital readers. It's actually quite an interesting laptop. It was developed by a, a tiny little team out of MIT. Um, I think there were between eight and 15 people that actually did this entire development. One of the neatest things about these things is that they actually will communicate together. So everybody flip up the ears on the laptops. So now the laptops will actually find each other and they'll actually create a community together. That just shows you in the center and it, shows, it should show any other laptops that it's found. The moment you turn them on, they find each other and they create a mesh of networks uh, between all the devices. So everybody can see everybody else. You can actually all become part of a neighborhood. And once you're part of the neighborhood, you can actually share everything that you've got. So if one of you can just get a connection to the internet, or if one of you has a book, you can all share that book between each other. Oh, it makes your writing bigger. Hold it The laptop has been created with cheap materials and programmed with free open source software. The cost is approximately $150 per unit. They're actually designed to go in very harsh environments. There are no moving parts, there are no fans, there are no components that can get gummed up. They use very little power. You can read them in bright, bright sunlight. These are far and away less expensive and much better suited to the environments that they're going to be going into than anything else out there. The truth is, many of these communities will never have a library, but access to free online books may give them a chance to become active readers. Several governments around the world have purchased the laptops and are beginning to distribute them. Now, this would be a really awkward book if you had to walk around with uh, your book looking like this, wouldn't it? So one of the things that you can do is you can, first of all, flip this around. Close up the ears because you're already connected. Flip it around like that. So there you go. made France my new home is because of its relationship with reading. The French buy more books than readers in any other country. Perhaps here we can best understand the past and the future of reading. 
A clear indication of the importance of readers in France can be seen here in the jury room of the prestigious France Inter Book Prize. This year, I happen to be the jury's president. The jury members come from every corner of France, ordinary citizens who apply for their jury position by writing a letter about their passion for reading. Je me sens parmi mes, mes confrères et mes consoeurs Euh, puisque j'ai lu vos lettres et vous ne savez pas jusqu'à quel point c'était un coup de joie de, de, de lire votre, votre émotion, votre passion, le fait que... Euh, dans the next morning, after a long night of deliberations, the jury announces the winner to the nation on public radio France Inter. En l'église Saint-Roch à Paris. France Inter, il est 8h05, suite du journal. Patrick Cohen. Bonjour Alberto Manguel. Bonjour. Vous ne vous contentez pas de composer des romans, vous en lisez beaucoup tout le temps, paraît-il. On vous présente souvent comme un lecteur vorace et vous aviez le redoutable privilège de présider cette année le jury du livre Inter. 10 livres en compétition, un jury de 24 auditeurs venus de toute la France. Pouvez-vous nous annoncer le nom du roman et du lauréat qui ont été choisis Nous avons choisi un parmi ces, ces très bons dit roman et le prix inter de l'année 2008 c'est Henri Beauchot pour le boulevard périphérique chez Actes Sud et c'est sans doute la récompense voilà applaudissements dans, dans ce studio avec euh, des lecteurs auditeur de France Inter et membre du jury du Livre Inter. Sans doute, j'allais le dire, la récompense la plus étonnante de l'année littéraire puisqu'elle vient couronner un auteur de 95 ans. Parlez-nous d'Henri Beauchot. La littérature ne s'arrête pas. <rire> la preuve. Regardez vos livres, vous avez une grande bibliothèque Oui, oui, les livres, je les garde, je les lis, je les relis, euh, euh, par exemple... Euh... Fatou Lema is one of the jury members. Surprisingly, since he only arrived in Paris a few years ago, from the Ivory Coast. Je l'ai feuilleté, je suis revenue sur des passages qui m'ont ému, et euh, moi, mon rapport au livre est vraiment essentiel. Charnel, euh, le livre, c'est une fenêtre qui s'ouvre sur le monde, et euh, c'est ce qu'on peut offrir en partage euh, à un autre, à un enfant, à un ami. C'est un beau livre, c'est vraiment le plus beau des cadeaux. Aujourd'hui, ce qui est extraordinaire, c'est que nous pouvons nous réunir comme ça, 26 lecteurs, et parler librement de ce que nous aimons. Ce n'était jamais comme ça avant. Exactement, oui. Il y avait euh, toutes sortes de censures, de, de restrictions sur la lecture. Oui. Et nous ne sommes pas conscients, je crois, aujourd'hui, jusqu'à quel point nous avons ce pouvoir, cette, euh, cette, cette liberté. liberté oui. Mais vous, vous l'avez éprouvé en, en arrivant euh, sûr, en France, en France oui, oui. et découvrant que la lecture vous donnait en quelque sorte une, 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 une liberté, une identité oui, de lectrice. Oui, 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 surtout ça. Oui. 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 Au travers de l'amour. Euh... Readers need choices about what they read. The supermarket model of publishing, in which decisions about what to publish are made not by readers but by accountants, means that there are fewer titles available in the book chains and online stores. Less titles, more heavily promoted blockbusters, fill the available shelf space in all our bookstores. Having fewer writers' voices denies readers a chance to expand their horizons. Readers need to have access to a variety of books anytime, whether it's in an old bookstore or through an electronic book search. Too often people view this as a dichotomy, as digital replacing print. And I think with younger audiences it might replace, and with older audiences it might supplement. In the future, people are going to be reading content through all sorts of sources and devices. You'll read a lot of stuff online. You also may read it through a dedicated book reader. People are going to do a lot of reading on their cell phones. And people will still use a good old-fashioned book. People will adjust what they read where. 
to whatever works for them. To read anything I wanted, to feel free to read broadly, is what I learned from the great Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges in my youth, that we should all get to wander in the halls of the Library of Babel, the limitless library of the universe. We were reading Agatha Christie with Stevenson, Kipling with Plato. He would make a, a remark on, on Aristotle while we were reading Henry James and show how the two came together. He upset every idea that I had from uh, the traditional libraries. And instead he said, you are the one who decides. You, the reader, are the one who says what counts and what doesn't count. What will remain as literature and what won't, and you make your choices. To be denied access to anything published is to deny ourselves a chance to fulfill our most generous potentials, to become a free, questioning human being for whom the world is an open book.